This podcast is sponsored by ID90 Travel, an airline's one-stop shop for your employees' past travel reservations, no-fee interline discount hotels, rental cars, and cruises. Skip the hassle and high cost of maintaining antiquated past ticketing and travel discount systems with ID90 Travel's modern, all-online, all-in-one platform. Lufthansa Group reported second quarter earnings, and it was all very predictable, very orderly, very much what everybody expected. Yeah, but not what they wanted. Well, okay, there is that. But let's talk about the predictability first. Lufthansa Group again did better than Air France KLM, but worse than IAG. Lufthansa had a 7% operating margin compared to Air France KLM's 5% and IAG's 10%. This all has become a very familiar story, which begs the question, can Lufthansa break out of its rut? Um, Sure it can. In today's show, we'll look a little closer at what's driving Lufthansa as well as what's holding it back. I'm Jason Cottrell, Vice President of Airline Weekly. And I'm Seth Kaplan, Managing Partner of Airline Weekly. We'll also look at Air Canada's and WestJet's role reversal and some of the more interesting second quarter earnings reports from Copa, Iceland Air, and Indigo. The door is open and there is no velvet rope because everybody's welcome in the Airline Weekly Lounge. As mentioned, the Lufthansa Group's operating margin was 7% in the second quarter. Uh, Of course, it's more meaningful to talk about the individual airlines within the group, and the operating margins for each unit went as follows. Lufthansa mainline was actually better, 8% operating margin. Swiss led the way with 10%, Austrian with 5%, and Eurowings had a negative 1%. And the maintenance unit uh, was 8%, and the cargo unit a negative 6%. Seth, they are clearly getting a lift from Swiss. What is Swiss doing right? Well, uh, a lot of it is what Swiss has always done right. I mean, this has been the history, really, since it became a part of the group back in, what was that, 2005? You know, Swiss, don't forget, uh, before it became a part of the Lufthansa Group, was, in terms of its cost structure, a new airline. Uh, You know, the old Swiss Air died. Uh, They sort of restructured it into this, this, um, this greenfield, start over from scratch company uh, with a very attractive cost structure. And, and so it, it's an airline that because it, uh, you know, although people might think of it as, as just kind of the ver- conversion from Swiss Air in terms of its cost structure is, is you know, not decades and decades old. It's, it's uh, you know, only a decade and a half old. Yeah, uh, has a rather good cost structure and, and a rather rich revenue environment. Uh, you know, Switzerland is, is, uh, is, is a rich country, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's Zurich hub is, is rather powerful and, uh, you know, kind of got Geneva down to a point where, where it works, uh, Geneva, easy jet, very competitive there, not, not a, not a huge hub hub for uh, Swiss, but, um, uh, it does what's profitable there. And, and as an airline, it, it works very well within the Lufthansa group. Eurowings had a negative 1% operating margin. That's an improvement over the negative 22% margin in the first quarter. At the very least, the trend line is attractive. Is that something Lufthansa can hang its hat on? Well, yeah, I mean, look, you know, negative 1% in, in what should be a peak-ish quarter. I mean, the third quarter should be the best, but second quarter should be okay. You know, obviously not terribly impressive. Now, it, it's still very much in its startup phase, particularly in terms of long-haul flying. So you give them some benefit of the doubt. Um, but the the sort of the quarter-over-quarter quarter gain, uh, second versus the first, I mean, part of it just is that you know, everything's better in the second quarter than it is uh, in the first quarter. And as a group lost money at the operating Mar- uh, level rather, uh, you know, just just marginally, but lost money in the first quarter, and as you said, at that seven uh, percent mar- margin in the second quarter. So, you know, some of that is is just explained by the fact that it's it's uh, a better quarter for everything. But yeah, you know, certainly it's it's uh, you know gaining some scale, working out all the operational challenges and so forth. It's not going to run. 20 negative 22 percent margins forever Lufthansa wouldn't let it do that but uh you know in terms of whether it's something that's that's going to be worth all the uh, and I'm talking about uh both the investment 
you know, narrowly defined literal literal investment in the thing and the brand and all the you know, just sort of setting up this this uh, whole operation and also the political capital that it used with its unions to get them to accept it, uh, all the labor strife and everything. You know, that's going to be a tougher question. Uh, Euro wings would have to be a pretty big success to to justify all of that. And obviously, at least at this very early stage, it's not, uh, you know, in terms of transatlantic fly, flying, I mean, trends aren't all that favorable right now. Fuel costs are very low. Uh, so, so you would hope that it would turn the corner rather soon uh, in order to believe that this uh, was indeed a good decision by Lufthansa. By the way, if you want to hear more on Eurowings, we discuss them a bit deeper in episode 39 of The Lounge. Looking at Lufthansa overall, they are doing better than Air France KLM, but management is surely not happy with the results, and their story is very much the same as Air France KLM. Both companies earned a small profit that was largely fuel-driven, and meanwhile, they are looking at some frightening revenue trends. Yeah, unit revenues falling very significantly. That was the quote uh, during the earnings call. Executives noted, of course, all the new episodes of terrorism, uh, including uh, more recently terrorism in Germany itself. Germany, which had long seemed, uh, I mean, of course, you knew it wasn't immune, but it just wasn't where things were happening. And now, in fact, there, there have been those incidents there. And yeah, uh, management said yields are falling at a pace that they lost last saw back in 2009. Uh, we all know what a bad year that was, of course, the uh, peak of the global financial crisis. And, you know, uh, Brussels Airlines, Lufthansa owns 45 percent of that rough year. Obviously, the terrorism in, in, in Brussels, which has hurt demand. And then you've got the economic weakness in Africa. Which, uh, which the airline serves as kind of its, its specialty. Uh, Lufthansa, don't forget, has a 50-50 joint venture with Turkish Airlines. It's called Sun Express, uh, which you know, brings tourists into Turkey and, and so forth. Well, yeah, you can imagine that's not going terribly well. And uh, yeah, so unit revenues uh, not getting better, and that does include even the U.S. market, which had until now been a bright spot. So where are the bright spots and how does Lufthansa get out of its rut? Well, they said transatlantic business travel remains solid. So that, that tends to be less less sensitive to uh, to, to the fears of terrorism. I mean, you know, uh, obviously, if you're talking about a place like Turkey, that's different. You know, all, all kinds of people are, uh, you know, perhaps going to avoid a situation like that. But, uh, you know, the incidents we've seen in Europe, that's not going to scare away most business travelers. You know, even I mentioned uh, the Turkish market, even that is... I hate to use the term mixed blessing to describe something that's so bad. You know, Turkish Airlines, yes, it's a partner. You know, it's a Star Alliance partner and it's a joint venture partner, as we mentioned with, uh, with Sun Express. But it's also an important competitor, a very rapidly growing competitor. And to some degree, when Turkish Airlines suffers, uh, that, that does help Lufthansa. You know, people say, look, I'm not connecting in Istanbul. Well, it's kind of one less airline that Lufthansa is competing against in terms of the six freedom connections between, you know, between North America and, and uh, India and all the you know, various various uh, markets where, where Turkish does compete. You know, Lufthansa is getting as a group some of the latest, greatest aircraft technology, uh, you know, the A350s, the C-Series at, at Swiss. And they say uh, those, the A350s on the large end and C-Series on the smaller end, are just perfect planes for uh, particularly... Uh, the sort of small to mid-sized hubs like Munich, like Zurich, uh, the, you know, the right cost structure, the right size. And in fact, interestingly, management said that Munich is it has has similar profit levels to Frankfurt, you know, which is maybe not something you would have guessed. Um, yeah, they've, they've got good relationships with, uh, you know, other joint ventures now uh, with uh, Singapore and Air China to go along with a, a longer standing uh, relationships with United Air Canada, uh, with all Nippon to uh, to Japan and Asia. And so uh, um, so a lot is uh, still going right at Lufthansa. And, and you know, sure enough, it's it, it, it's an airline that that is profitable, uh, even even if it's disappointed that it hasn't really been able to have a, a, a breakout quarter. 
All right. It's always good to hear the hopeful case for Lufthansa. Uh, it's earnings season and we're falling behind as usual. So we're going to bounce around a bit looking at more interesting, uh, some of the more interesting stories to come out of second quarter reports. Let's first go to Canada, where Air Canada reported an 8% operating margin, while WestJet posted a 6% margin in the second quarter. This is interesting because usually it's WestJet with the upper hand. What has happened? Yeah, I, I mean, for, for, for a while, WestJet was one of the more profitable airlines in the world. World, and then you sort of had this convergence. And yeah, here you see a quarter where, where it's actually Air Canada with the uh, the higher margin. I mean, look, WestJet's uh, still growing rather rapidly. Uh, but now, as opposed to in, in previous years, doing it at a time when when demand in Canada um, just, just isn't keeping pace of the growth. You know, a lot of it... it ASKs, available seat kilometers, rose 7% year over year uh, in the quarter. And to be clear, most of it's driven by the service to London Gatwick, wide body service for the first time in WestJet's history on uh, 767s. Uh, that got off to kind of a rough operational start. And then you have the oil bust in, in Alberta. And, you know, I've said it before, but, you know, I think. Most people who, who follow the airline at all know that it started as as, uh, as sort of a Western Canada airline. Obviously, its name WestJet uh, evokes that. And I think we sometimes sort of picture it now as just kind of this 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 pan-Canadian airline. And indeed, it is uh, in all parts of Canada these days, uh, certainly all big cities and, and increasingly small cities too because of its turboprop operation. But it is an airline that when you uh, looked, certainly up until a year or two ago at where its, uh, it, its biggest hubs were, much more Western focused than Air Canada. You know, Calgary is still extraordinarily important. Uh, for example, of course, with demand having really fallen off in places like Calgary, uh, like Edmonton and, and smaller cities in that part of the country, it has uh, it has refocused uh, it, its its capacity to other markets. Understandably enough, um, but but it's hard to make a shift that big without without having some impact. I mean, you know, if 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 that's where it really wanted to fly to begin with, it would have done that you know, without waiting for the oil bus to do that. So, uh, yeah, so some of its markets that were long its best markets have, have just become uh, tough. And it, it says there's overcapacity and yield pressures in, uh, in, in, in U.S. markets, too, where it served you know, Las Vegas, California, Florida are ones that it uh, that it noted. And you know, unsurprisingly, corporate yields, too, uh, you know, related partly to, to all the uh, energy market issues. Uh, those are down to uh, and uh, close week, uh, week rather close in demand in particular. Uh, there's those last minute uh, bookings, which tend to be high fare bookings, just like in the U.S. Uh, some carriers have noted that WestJet also also has said that that suffered. Air Canada, meanwhile, is growing rather fast for an airline with a shall we say, lackluster home economy. In the second quarter, ASKs grew 11%. Yeah, driven by international routes. Uh, some of that just by densification. You know, the, the Air Canada has added a lot of seats to its planes. Uh, of course, there's Rouge, the low-cost operation, uh, which which operates rather dense aircraft. So, uh, so, so you know, that, that's part of the growth. Um, but yeah, also lots of new routes, uh, particularly, but not, not only uh, Rouge routes. Try saying that ten times fast. You know, it's 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 tried to play to its strengths. Look, the loony is uh, is weak, uh, and that's just not generally a great thing for airlines to be trading in a weak local currency because of how it inflates your costs. You know, your your fuel, your your aircraft ownership costs, typically denominated in U.S. dollars. But Air Canada has done a good job saying, well, okay, but that means that Americans are relatively rich, and and, and that we. Being you know, Air Canada can can lure some of them not only to visit Canada but to, to transit Canada on their way to Europe on their way to Asia because it can be cost competitive. You know it's 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 uh, you know, precisely because uh, the the Canadian dollar is weak and so uh, it, it's it's done that with uh, with a lot of success and it, it, it you know. Although, yes, there is overcapacity in a lot of markets, there have been cuts, including by WestJet, and those have helped. And uh, just a lot of the new service seems to be working out reasonably well. I mean, it, it, look, it's not going to hit a home run in all these markets. There's just too much new service for that to happen. But, you know, Toronto, Delhi, uh, it's already adding capacity. They're adding frequencies, actually. That must be working well. And it's adding Vancouver, Delhi. So it you know, it waited a long time to go back to India, which it pulled out of, oh gosh, almost a decade ago, uh, back when it had what it felt were the wrong aircraft, uh, just 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 gas guzzling A340-500s. Well, now it has what it thinks are the right aircraft to do it. 
Uh, and it's gone back, and, and it seems to indeed be working well. Okay, let's stay in the chilly climate, but move on to Iceland Air, who had one of its best second quarters ever, and that coincided with growing ASK capacity by 22%. This airline appears to be more bullish than Air Canada. Yeah, uh, uh, tough to to grow that quickly and do so profitably, but um, they've they've you know pulled up. Pulled off the trick now. Uh, I, I mean, look, their their fuel costs fell a lot. In fact, their their total fuel costs fell nine percent. Uh, I'm talking just total fuel, not 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 uh, you know per anything. Uh, even though they grew that twenty two percent, so obviously they benefited a lot from that. This this, this is you know largely a fuel story, uh, but but you don't you don't do as well as they as as they've been doing uh, only because of, of cheap fuel. Because of course airlines everywhere benefit from, from benefit from cheap fuel, and airlines everywhere are not all you know profiting. But but it it, it is doing well. Um, uh, you know. It, it does have some of the same exposure to the issues in Europe and, and uh, you know, the terrorism and, and, and all the rest of it, Brexit and so forth. But but it you know it seems to be navigating that rather well. It looks forward to another strong profit for the year. To get that though, this current quarter uh, is going to have to produce an outsized margin. This this is a highly seasonal airline. It did 30% at the operating level, 30% margin last summer. And uh, it's going to need something close to that again to have a uh, another really strong year. And it's going to need that in the face of uh, of weakening fares that it's been noting along with uh, everybody else. And, and and in fact, it it has lowered its full year profit guidance, even though it expects a uh, a decent year. OK, moving on to an airline that we've compared to Iceland Air before. Copa. They earned a mediocre 7% operating margin. That's not surprising given the state of Brazil and Venezuela. The interesting part is that there are signs that the worst might be over. Yeah, so weakening profits, but the good news that, you know, the trends going forward might be improving. And of course, that's what everybody's really really looking for. I mean, this this is an airline that was long one of the world's most profitable. I said that before about WestJet. Here's another one that when you looked at sort of top 10 airlines in the world a few years back, Copa was always there. I mean, sometimes it was top one, two, or three. And then everything that we know happened, especially in Brazil, Venezuela, and Colombia, just so many of this airline's markets were impacted that although it did its best to reallocate capacity and slow growth, I mean, there was just, that was too much to stomach. Now, uh, you know, that 7% margin, I should say, you know, that, that was impacted significantly by wrong way hedges. That would have been 11% without those uh, wrong way hedges. You know, it, it's it's by the standards of many other airlines around the world still doing very well, just not by its own lofty standards lately. But lately, uh, look, Latin American currencies have been strengthening. Uh, that's very useful. Um, it, it just just the macroeconomic trends uh, seem to be stabilizing. So Copa said, you know, it, the close in bookings, kind of a proxy for business travel demand, are are uh, actually improving. That, that's you know, it's that contrast with what I said about, you know, WestJet's comments. And then we heard uh, U.S. carriers saying that those were deteriorating. So Copa actually uh, improving its uh, its annual profit forecast, actually raising it uh, to sort of the, the 11 percent to 13 percent range, which, which again, you know, not good by its own standards of most years, but better than what it had previously forecast not to mention better than than what a lot of other airlines around the world you know can can, can hope in a, in a good year and, and believe it or not even venezuela which uh you know i think a lot of us think it was the most troubled market of all even venezuela remains profitable for copa uh not what it once was but it seems like so many other airlines understandably ran for the hills got out of venezuela um that you know sort of left the place to to copa which is uh which is doing its best to navigate the market. Okay, we'll depart Panama and move to India, where there is no fretting about the economy at the moment. Indigo posted a handsome 15% operating margin. That's the best we've mentioned today, by the way. And Indigo grew traffic by 19%. But we wrote in Airline Weekly that this masks the darker side of India's growth. Can you explain that a bit? Yeah, well, I mean, they're just... just so much capacity growth and indigo is at the top of the market there uh you know this has been the arguably the most disciplined best managed airline um you know just sort of a an lcc really focusing on on uh corporate traffic very very dense network 
you know, has a hundred airplanes, but, uh, but only serves 35 cities. Um, so, so that's, that's a, a, a density kind of, you know, looks kind of like Southwest in, in, in the U S let's say, uh, just very high frequency business travel friendly markets, but, uh, but it's growing and, and, uh, everybody in India is growing. Uh, and, and so sure enough, uh, Indigo's average fares dropped 11%, uh, during the quarter. So uh, obviously um, not not helpful at all. And yeah, fuel prices fell, of course, um, as they did almost everywhere. But, you know, capacity growth of 25 percent demand, quite frankly, is, is, is just not keeping up with supply in India. Uh, and that's OK for as long as fuel price can for fuel prices continue falling. Um, but this is an airline that's that's uh, dealing with some labor cost inflation. And so it can't count on. Uh, fuel saving the day, uh, you know, much longer. It, it's going to have to get its hands around the capacity situation, which, you know, in a very competitive market, of course, it alone does not control, it doesn't control most of it. And, uh, you know, otherwise it'll continue to see this margin contraction, even if it remains uh, among the most profitable, if not the most profitable airline in India. Uh, you know, one one wish issue it's had, by the way, is with its A320 NEOs. Um, you know, it has the Pratt & Whitney, Pratt Whitney engines as revolutionary gear turbofan uh, engines, uh, which uh, a lot of airlines have, have very much anticipated, but that had uh, teething pains, I guess you could say, issues uh, uh, where it just took uh, longer to uh, start them up and get going than airlines wanted. And, and Indigo is, is, uh, is, is vi- visibly frustrated with the fact that it wasn't able to get all of its uh, A320 Neos flying uh, as, as quickly as it wanted. Let's move on to something completely different. To all of you would-be authors out there, let me give you a word of caution. If you write a book about a company, you will become somewhat attached to that company for, well, as far as we know, forever. <laughs> Longtime listeners know that Seth wrote a book about Delta that was released earlier this year. And of course, Delta had a bit of a hiccup on Monday. And when Delta has a hiccup or a sneeze or a glitch for that matter, Seth's Daily Planner immediately catches fire and then explodes into a million pieces. Anyway, I saw you all over the mainstream media. And so let me ask you, what time did your phone start ringing on Monday? I think it was a little before six. Uh, you know, the, the issue had started a few hours before that. But then, you know, by the time uh, journalists kind of real, were waking up and realized it. Uh, uh, yeah. And um, yeah, at that point, uh, you know, there was a global ground stop. Uh, this airline, by some measures, uh, certainly by revenue last quarter, the the largest airline in the world, uh, it, yeah, it just, just wasn't letting any flights depart anywhere in the world. And, um, uh, you know, of course, as, as time went on, we learned what happened. Uh, essentially, a power switch uh, seems to have failed and, and not switched uh, some critical systems over to backup power. Uh, when when a, a primary source of power was lost, and uh, yeah, it, it created uh, a huge issue for an airline that is uh, generally known for its operational reliability. Do you get the feeling this is a one-off event, or is Delta somehow systemically vulnerable? No, I think it's a one-off. I think it's it be, be precisely because it was just such a weird thing that uh, I mean, you could bet they test all the systemic stuff, you know. Uh, so here it was just this 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 one obscure part where there's, you know, no way to test this in a live environment, um, you, you know, the, the, until it happens almost by, by definition. It's, it's uh, just one of those things. Uh, you can bet that that same thing won't happen again, uh, but you can also bet that uh, some other thing will happen at some other airline uh, in the U.S. or around the world. It's just the nature of the business. We've said on the show before that Delta has been reaching new levels of operational excellence. And for a while now, the airline has been talking about earning a booking premium based on their operational reputation. In other words, people will spend a little more with Delta because they know the plane will arrive on time, their bag will arrive on time. Does yesterday's event jeopardize that booking premium? Yeah, I mean, uh, in the sense that when you are trading partly on your your reputation and earning, I mean, Delta says it's billions of dollars in revenue premiums a year over its competitors. Uh, sure, I mean, it, you know, that, that's at risk if they perceive you as being as being less reliable. But uh, you know, having said that, um, the 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 likelihood is that uh, Next week, Delta will be uh, the most reliable airline in in uh, 
uh, you know, the most reliable giant airline in the, in, in the world once again. And so uh, in all likelihood, as long as it handles the aftermath of this well, uh, it'll be just fine. The uh, the direct the profitability impact of this is is, is not going to be all that large. You know, it's, it's going to be something like a like a snowstorm, you know, something in the tens of millions of dollars for a company that does 40 billion a year in revenue. And so, yeah, it, it just needs to make sure to now do absolutely everything it can going forward. Uh, you know, for a while, the mainstream media are going to be watching it more closely. Uh, you, you know, every little thing at Delta that you usually wouldn't hear about, you'll probably hear about. That's just how this goes. So really needs to dot its I's, cross its T's. Uh, and, and if it does, uh, no reason to think that uh, its reputation won't be intact. Okay, final question of the day. Last month, Southwest also had a major problem, and I noticed the mainstream media seem to be developing this narrative that because airlines are so dependent on technology, that this is some kind of new era, some kind of new normal. Are you buying that? Nah, I mean, it's look, look what I mean, in the case of Southwest, uh, it, it's it's part of the problem is that it's not dependent enough on, on new technology. It, it has actually some some uh, rather antiquated systems. And uh, you know, kind of limping along as as it awaits the implementation of its new uh, reservation system. Of course, airlines depend on technology. All companies do. Uh, it does a lot more good than harm. Uh, you, you know, Delta is is one airline, certainly, although not the only one, uh, that in recent years ha- has really figured out ways to let to let the technology you know handle a lot of the routine tasks, so that the people. Uh, can handle the the complex tasks. You know, even when you have something like what happened this week, you know, a decade ago, you would have had countless people uh, just very manually sort of looking for that next seat to reaccommodate customer. Simple kinds of of, of rebookings, uh, and, and and it would take a while. And, and during the course of that, people would miss would miss the flight opportunities that they could have taken. Nowadays, you know, that kind of stuff happens automatically. And the people can focus on the more complicated situations. You know, the technology has 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 done more good than harm in many ways. I mean, you know, part of it simply is that this is a less labor intensive industry than it once was, uh, and and that has lowered the cost of travel. Uh, so if you had the same levels of employment that you had uh, decades ago, you know, airfares air, air would be a lot more expensive. That that too would be bad for for travelers. Uh, so. Uh, th- this seems to be a pretty good equilibrium, uh, especially in the U.S. market. If you look at it now, where yeah, airlines have gotten to a point where they're rather rather profitable, um, but their employees have rather stable employment and are you know earning a pretty good living, uh, at least for the airline industry. And and, and customers overall have a, a a pretty good experience, especially on on Delta most weeks, uh, although uh, certainly not this week. We haven't plugged it in a while, so here goes. The book is called Glory Lost and Found, How Delta Climbed from Despair to Dominance in the Post-9-11 Era. Search Delta Book on Amazon. For Seth Kaplan, I'm Jason Cottrell, wrapping another episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge. I got to say, I think we have exercised real restraint in plugging the book. Yeah, good for us. 